Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Melvin Way. I have many plant growing series on my YouTube channel. This is one such plant growing series. It's the first episode. There will be many more to come. And this one covers days 0 through 23. The subject is a fall gold raspberry. It's a bag of a cutting that I bought at Lowe's, local big box store. And it's got a descriptive tag and um, a few shoots that look pretty healthy. This one looks great. And there's one uh, towards the top that looks great as well. So this should be pretty easy. I expect to just plant this in moist or wet dirt and see it grow. So that shoot looks a little rough around the edges, but it's the most developed one. It looks like the top of the stick, the cutting was just broken off violently and there are some backup shoots for the plant further down as well. So let's take a look at what the packaging has to say. So fall gold raspberries, frambuesas, that's Spanish, uh, 997, uh, large soft berries that should ripen in July. So it's late January at this stage. Uh, towards the end of the episode, it'll be mid-February 2018. So remove plant from package, um, soak roots in pail of water while you're digging a hole, dig a hole large enough, um, you know, pruning that won't come until much later, water thoroughly once a week. Uh, so I'm not going to follow all of that exactly, but there are some pictures that involve the pruning which comes much later and I just wanted to get started. It was uh, winter time and this balcony doesn't receive a lot of sunlight per day. Maybe only a good two and a half hours at the time of this filming. And then the sun is hitting everything at an angle so it looks all hazy um, when the sun isn't directly shining on everything. So I just wanted to get a quick start and start filming because I know every day counts. So if I were to have left this bag unattended on my balcony for another few days or if I procrastinated for a week regardless of whether it was in the sun or the shade it wasn't going to fare too well in my opinion on Lowe's it was just sitting on a shelf outside a metal shelf with all these other cuttings and products plant products and they were just roasting in the sun so I always hear that you shouldn't have cuttings exposed to too many hours of direct sun a day that's true for this case then this will be perfect because this balcony only receives about two and a half hours of direct sun at this point of filming so that means this thing won't dry out or just get burned in the sun so I'll show you a close-up of what looks to be this uh, L stick or hockey stick so that's 10 bucks right there it's got two shoots at the very bottom Although I suspect that those are backups for the plants and this plant won't send anything out of those um, unless it really needs to. So there's a root that was pointing upwards. This was broken off. Um, maybe the L is just the result of this thing being twisted or bent. I don't know. It looks natural. So I have no idea which part of the plant this came from, which section, and it's got all these dried desiccated roots which I don't think will do anything only the one or two spots where you saw uh, these white fleshy roots sticking out and for some reason they're growing upwards those will uh, be the first point of access for water for this stick and hopefully it'll send out a lot more roots if I give it the right conditions so you've seen this stuff already uh, top shoot looks a little beat up but I think this thing will be good to go it should be pretty easy to get this thing to grow and instead of soaking this whole thing in a pail of water like the instructions said I'm just gonna wash off some of these wood shavings so the wood shavings weren't very wet and I don't know why they wouldn't want this thing to just get a big head start while it's in the store I think they want you to witness all of that yourself and they don't want a cutting that's overly developed and becoming weed-like in its growth while it's sitting on a store shelf. So I took this pot from a previous growing series. I had a pineapple crown cutting, uh, one inch deep, 
it had a fruit flesh with it, it generated a lot of mold, but this was probably the best pot uh, given its smaller size. I don't want to have a giant pot to start uh, this plant series because the dirt might just get too wet if I over water and then it'll just sit there and be unable to dry out for a long time. I don't imagine this cutting will use a lot of water for quite some time with uh, so little foliage. So I'm just taking a mirror on day four and I'm reflecting some light in there. The watering tray is completely dry. All I see is residual dirt, body mix. So I'm reflecting some light to get um, some better videography here with my mirror and so far so good I haven't really seen any changes I think as with many other plants or cuttings uh, it will suffer from some kind of transplant shock when you first plant it in dirt like that it's a different substrate it's potting mix that's been sterilized two years ago or longer I think when I had my century plant series maybe that was three years ago already and then between that and now I use this to try to grow a pineapple crown and you can watch that series on my YouTube channel if you're interested but I do have a remaining crown in the pot to the left and there's been no real change uh, I didn't water on that first day so by day seven I was starting to get worried I realized that I had severely underwatered some of my plants such as mango seedling and thus it was burned and dying and it was actually going like that for three months so I decided to do a deep watering for all my plants and I saw almost an immediate albeit imperceptible response so for this raspberry cutting I just kept watering until I saw some water trickle into that dry watering tray and then I stopped it doesn't have a very large capacity this pot and the soil is actually mostly potting mix it's got some other things in there and some uh, rotting organic detritus from previous growing series I've added chemical fertilizer and uh, crushed up vitamin pills to supply some calcium carbonate and trace minerals uh, trace metals so the soil should have everything it needs and I've also sifted some wild California hill dirt in there which if I keep this pot wet it'll greatly accelerate the decomposition process of all those little wood chips, bark chips and sphagnum peat moss in there. So it's day 11 and this is just a weather report from my Windows 10 weather app to show you how warm and abnormal the weather has been in San Diego in uh, January, February 2018. It's been like this uh, for as long as I can remember. A few weeks, there were two days of rain, and after that, it was just dry and very warm. So, fortunately, I supply the water here. That's not an issue. And the sunniness will definitely help, unless you think the raspberry cutting is getting too much sun, then it doesn't help. So, here's what it looks like now. So, that top shoot looks burned. I'm still thinking at this point that it just died of thirst because the root system wasn't established enough and I didn't water enough. The bag did say after all water thoroughly once a week. So after a week on day, what was it, day seven, I did a thorough deep watering and this second sprout, the shoot seems to have responded. It's growing. The edges look a little rough. Typically there are defects there and you don't see them until all the foliage grows a lot bigger. And that bud looks like it's ready to make a move as well. So the bark has a nice texture to it. It's a little spiny towards the bottom as you can see. That node has nothing going on. So that's just dead right there. And it seems like the spikes have been cut off or maybe it just wasn't that dangerous like a cacti or choya or whatnot. So these bottom two buds are just there as backups in my opinion. So it's day 20. I'm doing my mid-month deep watering. I know February is a shorter month. So that's a little bit more frequent and this is on fast forward. So it's just a process of waiting for the water to sink in. And I don't water all around the perimeter. I just want to get the center 
and this isn't a very big pot so there won't be a lot of dry potting mix on the perimeter as with my much bigger pots to the left and to the right in the watering tray you can see some dead roots from previous series I think those may have been from the century plant or maybe some other plants and you can see all these little ants in there as well so I don't know why ants are always bugging my pots but they're either looking for water or trying to make a nest you can see a little bit of water starting to accumulate in that depression on the outer inside uh, watering tray so it's day 23 and the top shoot is coming back to life and I'm very pleased to report that the second and third shoots are doing very well um, everything's very small at this point still so the videography is a little tough but at this point it's easier to see stuff uh, camera has an easier time focusing so you can see this is almost like a little head of broccoli it's got all these shoots and uh, features that I haven't seen before as it gets bigger and the foliage looks nice it reminds me of some wild blackberries I've seen in the hills and mountains around here in greater San Diego County and beyond and this third shoot going from top to bottom is doing pretty well it's not as fast developed as the second one but since the first one sort of got roasted and it's now just resurrecting recovering uh, the second and third ones will do the job and probably be the uh, points where this stick sends out most of its foliage and growth and I don't think it's in the plants best interest to send out stuff from these bottom two um, which aren't really that much more developed than in the beginning of this video you see all these uh, spikes they're not really dangerous um, so yeah these are just backups and that's basically it so thanks for watching and please stay tuned for further episodes Welcome back for a second episode of Growing Fall Gold Raspberry Cuttings. It's day 27. Was this burning of the shoot, the top shoot, my fault? I would think not. I think the transplant shock and the adjustment um, coming from that store bag from moist wood chips, not really sawdust, to this soil medium and the watering, whatnot, the differences in sun exposure um, and just changes in conditions were enough to uh, cause a little bit of dying back at the top but that seems to have all been remedied as of day 27 it seems like the top shoot is recovering and the second shoot has done really well we're finally getting to see some of the structure and all of its glorious detail looks like some nascent developing supermarket vegetable so I did a little bit of reading on the fall gold raspberry. There are many, many varieties of raspberry in the wild hills, uh, in riparian zones, in California, in the mountains or whatever, in greater San Diego County and beyond. I've seen some blackberries, wild blackberries, but not raspberries, I don't think. So there's nothing going on between that third uh, shoot from the top the third node all the way down to here where you see the second to last one on the bottom is a little bit green and it seems to be developing it's day 31 phoenix rising from the ashes continues that top node is recovering nicely this uh, second node from the top is developing the most of course it was the first mover and it seems like this stick has devoted most of its resources to sending foliage out of the second and the third nodes. So we're seeing this uh, triple leaflet, uh, is that a compound leaf structure? So I don't know if this came from a primocane or whatnot. Um, I did a little bit of reading about uh, the various types of raspberries and they have rhizomes and that's how they spread underground and they sent out these uh, suckers I think and they only last for about 18 months uh, this is all far in the future for this plant I don't know if we'll ever get there 
Um, typically I just want to show the beginning and the middle phases. Um, I don't have a lot of space to get all the way to the end. But as you can see, uh, the foliage is coming along nicely. It's a light green, it's not a dark green. And it may get a little darker as it matures. But as I was saying earlier, I sent out these maybe adventitious shoots or suckers or whatever. Um, not too clear on uh, what happens later on. But apparently uh, these primal canes live for about 18 months and then they become flora canes. Uh, in their second year and that's when the new shoots supposedly flower and grow berries so I'm doing this watering a uh, deep watering I kind of ventured off schedule I know I said previously in maybe this uh, series first episode and maybe some you know sequel episodes of other series that I was going to water twice a month but it seems like all advice uh, for this plant as came from the back and both online say that you should do a deep watering once a week that this is a thirsty plant and my intuition at first was that maybe I shouldn't overwater. I don't want to cause root rot for those nascent developing roots that come out but this is a relatively small pot and it seems like a very thirsty plant I've noticed a little bit of um, data to suggest that maybe the once a week is a better schedule or maybe do it like three times a month that's every 10 days like with everything it's not really scientific or statistically valid you're just gonna have to go by your own judgment depending on how hot and dry it is where you live and currently as of the filming of this little clip it's February 2018 so it's been a little colder than January we had a really warm and dry January with almost no rain then the night started to cool down and the days and it started drizzling a little bit in February so that's a little bit more normal it's day 35 uh, growth is accelerating um, what I just showed you earlier was just uh, you check the water tray to see if water drips down in there and make sure it doesn't overflow number one and number two you just want to make sure the soil has been wetted all the way through when you water you do your deep waterings once a week or every 10 days or however often you want to do this obviously if it were August or September um, when it's really really hot in San Diego County I wouldn't want to wait 10 days or two weeks maybe even once a week is not enough I'd have to do it more frequently in such a small pot and I could probably let the bottom watering tray fill up at that point although this pot has a very small tray and it can overflow and it's quite a nuisance if it just spills on everything creates a big mess so you can see there's continued development um, yeah it seems like uh, once a week watering is pretty good and I'm not sure if these leaves will get any darker but these are brambles they're not um, just obnoxious vines that spread and curl on everything with tendrils um, same can't be said for some of the vines I've had in the past they were just uh, really really high maintenance and hard to deal with on such a confined balcony so it's day 39 and there's been smooth sailing in this series so far um, we've had a cold February and I expect the weather to warm up as usual quickly and become hot and dry again starting in March or April and you know the typical San Diego County weather will ensue seems like these things are growing but they're more bushy rather than viney which is great I like my plants to have a little bit of structure and a lot more vertical growth because I have all these plant series going on on a balcony so I'm wondering if the leaves will get any darker but I've consulted the internet I think the foliage for this species or raspberries in general just isn't very dark um, it's not like those a passion fruit vine leaves that I had in 2017 last year where everything was just giant and uh, very lush dark green and that kind of affects the uh, videography of everything too because if you have a dark green leaves curling around everywhere all along this balcony rail in the background that's out of focus then 
that sort of affects the coloring of the video. And this is uh, winter, um, mid-afternoon sunlight. So that's kind of different from the videography that would be during the summer when the sun's uh, more overhead. But regardless, this is making some good progress. I don't expect any roadblocks anytime soon. I haven't focused on fertilization. I just focused on getting the watering right. The soil has been fertilized many times prior to this uh, series beginning. I'm using the same soil that's been, you know, had a lot of stuff added to it. Uh, crushed vitamins for calcium carbonate and trace minerals, metals. Um, I added a lot of chemical fertilizer in the past and I'm not sure how much of that has been used up or broken down. I would assume it just stays in the soil. So the top of this stick is developing and the bottom as well. I don't know where it's going with this little shoot at the bottom but since it's a bramble I think that it'll grow somewhere um, beyond uh, parallel. It'll grow upwards and that won't drag on the ground. There's nothing more annoying actually than having foliage drag on the ground and getting wet and then looking rotten as it did with my uh, Artemis Sinon plant uh, from 2017 early on. So I'm doing another deep watering and I'll do this about once a week. I think it's been maybe 10 days in this instance but um, as long as the soil looks wet and it's not too hot and dry then you're basically good to go and I'm going to take this time to water some of my other uh, developing plant series as well. So at the end of 2017, it turns out I was underwatering a lot of my plants and just problems galore in general struck. So that stick you see behind is the mango and it has little shoots and they're green and they're getting bigger. Um, very very slowly it's been taking forever for that thing to resurrect and the pot in front that's empty that I'm watering has a bunch of avocado seeds in it and I know those things take a very very long time to germinate and the weather is still a little bit too cold so that might take a while but I'm hoping that turns into a new series as well you got the Joshua tree and pineapple plant so I just rotated that uh, for the raspberry to see if the water tray is filling and it takes several minutes. Hello and welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's the third episode, day 41 of this growing fall gold raspberry cutting series. The top node has recovered nicely. Looks like an early stage miniaturized version of a vegetable sprouting there. And for the second node it has the most lush growth. There's a tip sort of towards the middle that's a little brown, a little burned. But other than that, 99% of the foliage that sprouted from this stick is very healthy looking. The foliage is greener now than it was during the filming of episode 2. That was my main concern back then. I felt that the foliage color was a little light, something was a little off. But you'll see as this episode progresses, all my concerns have been assuaged. So node 3 is no slouch either. It's producing a lot of foliage. It might even surpass node 2 in production. So I can't wait to see how the development of this stick plays out. It'll have the appearance of a mature a raspberry bush at some point. And it sends out canes. This is all new to me. I've never seen any of this before. I've seen California blackberries in the wild but I've never seen something just grow from a cutting like this. So I'm eager to see how this plays out. And then this node towards the bottom near the soil line has some foliage popping out as well. Maybe that's second to last node. Not much going down on the soil line right there. It's day 43. There is more development. Again, it looks like a nascent vegetable developing up there. Something you could uh, fry up and eat. So, I haven't seen any bugs yet. I hope none appear, but if they do, I'll have to adjust accordingly. Hopefully this doesn't have too many natural insect or parasite predators. So the foliage is getting bigger and nicer. Um, it's not really so much elongating as just shooting out petioles and these uh, compound leaves so far, which is nice. I don't like 
my plants to be too viney and spindly. So I think it's been the right amount of development. It's starting to accelerate because the weather is getting warmer again and pretty soon it'll be spring and the hours of sunlight will get longer. But at some point I'll move and that will maybe disrupt the rhythm of this plant a little bit. I think I'll be getting morning sun pretty soon rather than afternoon sun. Morning sun is less harsh and afternoon sun is uh, more harsh. Plus there's that hill that you may have seen um, not too far in the distance and that blocks out a lot of the late afternoon sun so that really limits what this plant can receive and all my other plants as well. So this is the only plant growing series that's going well so far. Uh, the pineapple hasn't received a great reception and this one just keeps giving me progress so I'm running with it. I do have a few other plant growing series um, in progress that should produce results over the course of the next few weeks but I'm glad I have this one series being productive right now a lot of my other stuff such as the mango seedling or what's left of it as you can see right behind us is taking forever to resurrect so to speak so I don't have a lot of material to work with uh, passion fruit vine looks to be in trouble looks like it's dying off but I'll, I'll have updates on those eventually I just wanted to wait long enough and I'm wondering if this shoot here is a primal cane or what's the deal uh, I'm sure many of you have much more experience than I do so maybe one of you can tell me what that is we'll get another look at it for the rest of this video as well in uh, subsequent days so it's day 46 finally we get some strong afternoon sunlight everything looks very lush and vibrant now and bigger so I have no more worries about everything looking all pale, pallid. The emerald green leaves you see here remind me much of the honeydew leaves in the 2013 series. That was my first plant growing series actually where I took the plants out from indoors with very limited LED light and put them on the balcony, on the bottom of the balcony actually, but I didn't have this table and the natural sunlight would hit during springtime and that started to accelerate the growth these leaves have that same green translucent look except they're not vine leaves this is more of a berry shrub or fruit shrub instead so the leaves look very healthy they're greener and they're getting larger and larger I don't think it makes any sense to disturb the equilibrium a plant is happy so to speak and by fertilizing or doing anything differently I would jeopardize that which I don't want to do not until the plant gets more established and generates a root ball that takes up this entire soil mass which is I believe optimal for most potted plants I'm wondering if that's a primal cane if any of you think it is uh, please let me know uh, many of you are much more experienced in berry growing so these uh, plants tend to shoot out various canes and when they're new in their first year they're called primal canes and then they become floral canes in their second year and bear fruit berries that are better actually in taste and quality so I'm doing this watering I know I promise to do it once every two weeks in the beginning of this series but I decided that that wasn't frequent enough the soil tends to dry out a little bit by the second week and the packaging that this um, stick came in and all the instructions I've read online say you should do a deep watering for your raspberry uh, plants your canes every week basically so I've been doing it every seven to ten days uh, this pot has six avocado seeds in it hope something happens there soon but um, yeah, I just do a watering until I see water dripping into that watering tray below. It takes a lot of this. Uh, you do a little bit of watering, wait for everything to sink in. And it sinks in a little bit more slowly than just regular potting mix because I have a lot of, well maybe not a lot of, but I have some wild dirt in there from the California hills in this neighborhood. And that tends to congeal and clump up with the potting mix in itself. and form an impermeable layer or a layer that takes a long time for water to trickle through 
and just keep repeating this process. It can be a little bit tedious, but I found that it definitely works. The conventional wisdom is it's better to do infrequent deep waterings than it is to do uh, frequent shallow watering. So that's exactly what I'm doing. And at least for this series, it seems like it's successful. So finally, we have water dripping down there, and I'll stop and water the other pots until I'm done with those instead. All right, it's day 48. It's only been two days since the last filming, but as you can see, the foliage looks a lot more green. It looks more mature. The leaves have more wrinkles and they may be thicker. Although part of all this may just be an artifact due to the overcast, uh, darker conditions compared to two days ago. And the camera itself, if there's a lot of green, if there's a preponderance of mature, lush leaves that are dark green, then the uh, coloring will be a lot more true, I think, at least for this uh, camera that I'm using. So the top note is coming along nicely. It now has more live stuff in it than dead, which is great. Uh, I look forward to um, seeing that just look healthy. And I could trim away all those little uh, brown bits, but I won't. I, I think it's just not even worth the trouble. Pretty soon everything will be overshadowed by lush green growth. Um, so there's just no stopping this growth train. It seems like uh, growth stock, basically, it's just going to go up and up day after day. So I hope that this will have the appearance more of a berry shrub or bush at some point rather than just a stick in the mud. But for now, it's very interesting to look at all this growth and see how the leaves develop. I still don't quite know for sure what the mature leaves will look like. You can see some of these are three-pronged compound leaves, but that big leaf from No. 2 just looked like something more akin to a, a maple leaf or something like that. So sometimes there are oddities in leaf development, as we saw with the passion fruit uh, last year, 2017 and 2016. Some of those leaves are just, um, you know, they only have one prong and the others have uh, three prongs and they're not always consistent in their size and shape. So it's just little interesting ends and odds that you notice when you get up and close and review the footage later on especially. So nothing from that node uh, down there. Maybe it's uh, burned or damaged. Uh, not every node needs to or will grow foliage. Some of those are just backup locations in case something happens everywhere else. And you can see a lot more leaf definition here as well in this uh, second to bottom node. And I'm still trying to decide whether that that green shoot at the bottom is a primal cane coming out or is it just a node in an unfortunate location. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next episode. All right, it's day 50. It's the fourth episode of this plant growing series, growing fall gold raspberry cuttings. And this thing at the bottom, it's just a shoot. I was uh, thinking it may be a primal cane in the beginning, but I don't think that's the case. And this node is sprouting rather nicely. It looks like the node above it is trying to sprout, but I think that's just some kind of feature or anomaly in the bark. Uh, spikes don't grow. They were already there. And the foliage at this node and uh, the two above it have done really nicely. I don't know how long this is going to go on for, and by saying that, I don't mean that the series is going to end anytime soon. I just mean... Um, how long is this foliage going to slowly bush out like this from all the nodes? Is it going to elongate and get long and fall over? Or are primal canes going to come out of the bottom at some point? It's got to have some place to put new foliage. Or is it just going to do this forever and ever? It seems like it's just doing this. It's been two months. So the series has gone on for two months, and compared to the California Wild Grape Cutting series that I did, I think maybe that was 2014 uh, or 2015, that one took a whopping 39 days just to get somewhere, just to get a little bit of... Actually, I think at that point it, was, it had roots coming out of a 
a spot that was above the water line. I had it in a cup of tap water and the tap water soaked up for a length of a few centimeters or inches maybe um, above the water line and that was where the roots sprouted. I remember there being dozens and dozens of um, chubby little white roots. So in this case it's just a commercial product. I have no idea what's going on underground. These leaves at the top look a little funny and deformed but I guess everything that came out of this top node was always a bit deformed like that. So it's day 53 and as I was saying um, with this top node it, the foliage looked like it was burned a little bit after I first bought it. If you go back and look at the first episode or if you remember that and all those burn uh, leaf parts are still there on display and then you have a really big leaf there that's almost singular at the top it's almost like uh, maybe a maple leaf and everything else is a, a three-pronged uh, compound leaf I guess so like the passion fruit vine uh, there are, are anomalies everywhere in leaf development it's not always going to go perfectly like you would expect it to. I basically expect the leaves of my plants to all look the same, especially this early on, but notice that that clearly isn't the case. So this will be a very green and bushy stick after a while. But yeah, uh, the California Grapevine series, that cutting was done in a clear glass of tap water. It took forever. I think uh, this has had a much better result and proves that you don't need to soak things in water. I just plant it in uh, moist ground or in this case it's just miracle Grow potting mix from uh, years ago I guess. I don't know. I've lost track of which batch of potting mix and which pots um, has been used for what and how old it is and whatnot. So it's day 58 and the growth continues and now we have a more normal looking compound leaf out of the top. So some of you may be bored at this point thinking well it's just doing the same thing over and over but as you've seen with many of my plant growing series when things go wrong then you wish for days like this when everything's going right so I'm just enjoying this series as I watch it pump out more and more leaves. It's been very, very pleasant to look at at a time, especially when everything else in uh, on my balcony was going wrong. Uh, the passion fruit vine died. Uh, the mango seedling stalled after, I think, just 37 days. And then it was all downhill from there. So I'm trying that again, and I'm trying it in clay loam, a wild neighborhood hill dirt and hopefully that will have much better results and I've left most of the tiny pebbles and sticks and uh, root fragments and whatnot in there but basically I think it'll do much better than potting mix because uh, I've had all this potting mix for quite a while and it seems like especially last year and the year before. I just got off to very, very slow starts for all my plants. I think that was because I sterilized the potting mix so there's no microbes. It would take quite a while for random spores to land in and form mycorrhizal fungi uh, relationships with the roots of my plants. And potting mix is just quite unnatural. It's uh, basically you're planting your plants in a rotting heap of wood chips and bark and twigs and things like that so uh, typically in nature it's supposed to be leaves lying on top of the, the soil that leach nutrients into the soil over time as it rains and in this case um, well I guess potting mix never I mean, it, it doesn't always go wrong. I mean, clearly it's growing in this case. It's maybe not growing that fast, but I don't know how fast a cutting like this is supposed to grow. 
and what kind of progress other people are getting at a similar time point after say 58 days 60 days um, so up to this point I've been doing just flood watering from the top down and then I wait for it to drain um, but I stop when I see water coming into the watering tray so that's been my modus operandi uh, maybe every two weeks uh, 10 days sometimes but never more frequent than that it's a small pot and I hope that the root ball or the root system takes up the entire pot pretty soon and forms a big root ball because in the past as with my sweet annie plant and others that have done that and colonized the entire pot and started circling around the pot um, at that point the plants largely indestructible in terms of being able to tolerate any kind of watering, overwatering, or whatever you can throw at it. In fact, they seem to never get enough water at that point or never be able to be quenched. So the foliage looks great now. It just keeps chugging along and I don't really have any complaints. I haven't fertilized, but then again, I've fertilized this little pot of soil in the past. I think this one was used for my century plant last because all the other pots look differently so that's the only association that I could form so in the future I'll use smaller pots for my plant growing series but you can see another pot in the background I haven't launched that series yet and those were well let's just say the seedlings have stayed small for a while but so I'll show you later on I basically did some square bottle watering and that stopped the malaise and then they took off and started perking up within 20 minutes and, and started growing some more later so the foliage on the bottom is doing nicely it's not doing that kind of annoying plant behavior well garden potted plant behaviors where the foliage just drags on the ground and gets wet on the mud or a wet potting mix and just rots away so um, the fact that everything's really really perky means I think the root system is very healthy so it's day 63 and regarding what I was talking about just a minute or two ago if you look at those seedlings in that big pot to the right um, many of them were just drooping and one of them had its leaf in the potting mix buried a little bit from a previous watering session where it's took the watering can and showered everything on the surface and let that all sink in and kept repeating that so for whatever reason I just tried to use a squirt bottle um, after seeing all of that and the leaves not responding not being hydrated and in that pot the seedlings perked up immediately within 20 minutes and they kind of took off after that so I think Maybe by squirting water indirectly, you're washing off whatever's ailing the root system and you're, you're also injecting air directly in there violently. So maybe that just aerates the root system and enables the roots to grow. The root system is the most important thing. I think in most of my cases, by the time I noticed something wrong with the shoot system, the root system was already long dead. Hello and welcome back. It's day 65. It's the fifth episode of growing fall gold raspberry cuttings. I'm adding some clay loam to amend the problems caused by growing in potting mix. This is an old pot. It's got potting mix that was once sterilized a very long time ago and I used it to grow various things such as the century plant. I added a lot of chemical miracle Grow fertilizer before and things like that and crushed Tums and vitamin pills so I'm sure there's still plenty of that in there and I think that helps but at the same time potting mix is potting mix it has a lot of problems even though I sterilized it years ago to get rid of the bugs such as spider mites it's just a loose medium of compost that's way too fresh it's mostly wood chips bark uh, twigs that's why the top before I laid on this dirt was all um, green and mossy or maybe that was uh, algae so I'm gonna spread this around um, that's all the dirt I have for the moment 
and just water from the top and I'm spraying first because it has a lot of clay it's a clay loam so it has electrostatic properties that are unfavorable to absorbing water at first if it's really dry but as you can see this absorbs pretty well it compares favorably with uh, some almost pure clay I got from 2014 so it's day 69 I think that's a primocane coming out because at first we thought it was just another node activating but the positioning was a little weird and it's got all these I wouldn't say spines but uh, spiky hairs that might irritate if I were to touch them that are not present for all the little stems and petioles further up so I think the majority of the foliage growth is now at the bottom for the what I think is a primal cane. Further up on this old floor cane, I think the growth has been relatively robust. I think this leaf that we're staring at once had a yellower edge. I think growing in potty mix deprived uh, the root system of proper development have developed a lot quicker and everything would be a lot bigger and more lush right now and we wouldn't have so many of these uh, smaller clumps of malformed leaves but there really is no evolutionary pressure for every single leaf or uh, compound leaf to look perfect that's why you see all these different sizes and shapes but I think part of that is still due to malnutrition but just like the passion fruit vine um, there are many other leaf formations outside of what you'd expect normally. You'd expect everything to develop and look exactly the same, but that's not the case with this plant, nor was it the case with my passion fruit vine. So it's kind of a jumbled mess um, for the top three nodes, I think. Instead of developing big compound leaves, it's just... Um, a lot of budding and offshoots and whatnot that don't get a lot of size. So on the bottom here you can see this little compound leaf dragging in the mud because I raised the soil level essentially. I still like the idea of watering with a squirt bottle. I think that helps get the clay, the clay loam down a little further into the root system and it also gets the water and aeration that uh, the tap root needs and maybe other roots directly where you're squirting at. So I'm going to water one more time from the top and hopefully this will get a lot more of this clay loam down in there where it could really really help the root system by providing nutrients and I'm just going to cut that little compound leaf over there because it's uh, dragging the mud and there's nothing I can really do. It, it doesn't really serve any purpose. I have so many leaves, I might as well just cut my losses. So at this point I thought that composting banana peels would serve to provide natural fertilizer for the plant over time. It would take maybe a few weeks according to say Gary's Best Gardening, a channel that I've been watching recently for this to decompose sufficiently so that next time I water from the top within a few weeks uh, the nutrients will trickle down into the dirt and be used by the plant. The plant will eventually get everything. It just takes a long time for things like this to decompose. So I thought I eat a lot of bananas. Why not just use the peels, which I can eat, to provide for a lot of nutrients. But the problem is they're unsightly and they take a long time to rot. So at day 72, I thought, well, that looks really ugly. I know it's only been a few days, but I've had a change of mind. I think I want to just get some more peels and blend them up. So I have six bananas worth of peels. I'm going to cut off the hard parts because I don't think those would blend very well. In either way, that's a very minimal waste compared to you know just throwing all this in the trash can anyway. So the stems are hard. Uh, I don't want to take that risk of just having them you know, clunk around in the blender and do nothing. So I'm going to add in some water. I don't know how much. I'm not following a formula or recipe. I'm just doing this according to what I, you know, feel like I should do. This is the first time I've ever done this. 
So I figured maybe a few hundred mLs of water, although the peels are in there, so it's actually a lot less volume than it says on the side. So I haven't used this blender for a long time, but it's a great blender, and I might as well use it for blending stuff. Um, I've considered blending leaves as well. So as you can see, it's pretty yellow in the beginning, just the way you'd expect it to look, almost like a banana smoothie. But as time went on, it became darker and darker. So I was really thinking, is this thing really oxidizing that fast before our eyes, just because of the speed of the mixing and you know all that oxygenation? Probably mostly foam at that point. You know, it's not um, it's not high in water. It's mostly foam and peel, I figure. So the first order of business is to get rid of all these chunks, which as you can see after, was it three days, I still look very yellow. And I did this on my Joshua tree pot too. I decided why not just use the banana peel smoothies. Know what that looks like. Um, it doesn't really resemble banana peels. You know, it resembles uh, bodily fluids uh, expulsions rather so this is very viscous maybe it wouldn't be if I had added in more water but I didn't want to add in too much water either the main purpose here is not to water the plant by doing this it's to provide for something that has a very very high surface area to volume ratio just so it can decompose at an exponentially faster rate so if it would take banana peel squares or whole peels uh, weeks or even months to decompose and get those nutrients in the soil surely this would get everything in the peels in um, maybe 10 times faster maybe 100 times faster so this stuff is really really viscous i regret putting my finger to even touch it because it's really hard to spread around and it just sticks to your fingers or all over the gloves in my case this is uh, one of the many reasons why I wear gloves because I have to do a lot of work on this balcony so uh, I also have to touch my camera and so on and open doors and, and whatnot and get uh, watering pails and whatnot so uh, it's a big mess but it doesn't contain a lot of carbohydrates or anything so it's not really gonna attract bugs although I did read that Maybe this could attract German cockroaches or many other kinds of pests, um, but we'll see. I haven't really seen anything lately um, on my balcony. Just uh, occasional errant fungus gnat that I'm not even sure is really from my pots. So I'm doing some watering from the top. This isn't dispersing like I thought it would. I thought it would disperse uh, much like a melting smoothie on a hot summer day. So it's day 74, and as you can see, in just two days, the color has changed significantly for the banana peel smoothie. Most of the growth is devoted to the bottom, to what I believe is the new primocane. And these leaves are bigger than ever. I think that has a lot to do with the hill dirt that I piled on top, even though the bottom 90% or so or even more actually is just potting mix so I believe that by watering from the top down after applying this clay loam a lot of it sifted in got onto the roots provided the macro and micronutrients that the plant needs and also it helps seal in moisture because potting mix is just loose aerated pieces of wood it's really different um, and it's got sphagnum peat moss but it, it's really different from what I have now and having a banana peel smoothie on top that's uh, solidified and congealed has basically sealed in the moisture that's why everything looks a lot perkier than it used to so that's a nice looking new compound leaf um, these leaflets all look pretty healthy now there are some in the back uh, near the base as I mentioned that are a little more deformed and small looking maybe a little bit more curled and wrinkled so I don't know what I can do about that but it's really no loss either way if those don't develop I could snip them all off and let them compost on the top 
So uh, in that channel, Gary's Best Gardening that I've been watching, says use real soil, which is essentially mostly rock dust, inorganic permanent material that won't shift around and rot away and generate toxic sewer gases. I know I've observed a fair bit of organic detritus in there as well, like roots and twigs that snap really, really easily. That stuff's all been decomposed maybe for months or even years. So that's okay, and it serves as spacers that provide for more oxygenation. But yeah, in summary, you want your inorganic fine material that won't reduce in volume over time from rot or emit toxic sewer gases, anchoring the plant, holding everything in place, and letting the plant draw its nutrients from. And you want the compost, organic detritus, on top of all that, far away from the roots, so it can't poison the roots or inhibit development, attract pests and things like that. Because once the root system goes, so goes the rest of the plant. So it's been five episodes and this has developed quite nicely. It's only been two days, but I think that banana peel smoothie is going to decompose very, very quickly and provide a lot more nutrients for the soil, although it's not a complete fertilizer. Probably have to add some leaves. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back. It's day 76 of this growing series with this raspberry cane. And as you can see, there's been a lot more growth. The banana peel smoothie has broken up into plates. They're somewhat rubbery, somewhat porous. I'll show you more later. Some of these leaves are curled, but everything's got a lot bigger. And this thing that I think is a primal cane is getting longer. Uh, some people think it might just be an offshoot uh, activated node that took off a little bit after I buried it. So regardless of what it is, uh, I got to call it something. So uh, I was just calling it a primal cane, but it's growing the fastest out of all the shoots so far. So it's uh, really nice how those new compound leaves look with the uh, three prongs and they're all ruffled like uh, potato chips. So everything's going pretty well and I don't foresee any problems. I just don't see any bugs. Uh, things are growing faster than ever. There might have been some yellowing of leaves earlier on, but um, that's more towards the top, those top three nodes. And some of those compound leaves up there are getting big as well and there's continual growth. I know the stuff that's around the old floor cane is all um, curled and some of it's deformed and just small. I think that was due to poor nutrition in the beginning. Remember this is mostly still in potting mix. I did heap on some clay loam later on and I really think that's what rescued the whole situation. Well not rescued as in this thing was in dire straits but I could tell that it wasn't going to do too well. You can see here two compound leaves that remain small are somewhat yellow green. They've got these uh, mottled yellow spots. I think that was just stuff that grew, foliage that grew when this plant was purely in potting mix. It wasn't receiving proper nutrition because as I've said many times, I don't think potting mix can establish good connections with the root systems of these plants. And very few of the plants I've grown on this channel have done well until um, they formed a root ball that could take over everything and drink directly from water at the bottom. So as you can see, the banana peel smoothies dried out pretty quickly, and then they lost volume by baking in the sun, and hence all the cracking and peeling. They still retain the consistency, these plates of uh, banana peels. They're very soft. Um, yeah, they're porous. Banana peels are are waterproof I think for the most part. So nowadays when I water, water passes through very quickly. In the beginning when I layered on all that clay loam from the outside, it's uh, a water repellent initially if it's very very dry. It takes a lot for water to get in there, a lot of time and effort, but after everything's been wetted repeatedly it just goes through very quickly. So drainage isn't a problem at all and water as much as I want. It's going in pretty much as fast as I'm watering, which is great. So it's day 80, and as you can see four days later, there's been a lot of growth. 
These compound leaves are much bigger. Each leaflet is quite sizable. That's a great sight. I really think this is due to the vastly increased nutrition and the fine particles that seeped in there no doubt have made contact with all the roots existing ones and developing ones and hence the plants able to absorb a lot more nutrition and it's constantly in a process of sending out more compound leaves so it's a very attractive plant it's becoming a little bit more bushy than I thought it would be I thought it would just be these spindly canes um, with not that much in the way of foliage. I didn't even think the leaves would get this big to be honest. But I think adding that wild dirt in the clay loam has really really helped. So this thing is taking on more of a cane appearance rather than just being um, yet another bunch of petioles in terms of width and robustness. So the plant's devoting most of its resources to this new growth that's coming out of the bottom, not so much towards the top. That's counterintuitive. I thought that most of the growth would have occurred at the top, really, especially at the very top node, because there's a lot more room to grow up there. But uh, apparently the plant has other plans in mind. So I don't know how long it's going to take for this banana peel smoothie that's all congealed into what looks like decaying banana peels but uh, that's the way it's sort of meant to be is for nutrients to trickle in down into the soil every time I water from the top and that's how it should be in nature so I read that banana peels are somewhat deficient in nitrogen in terms of macronutrient amounts ratios compared to potassium and phosphorus. Of course there are trace elements as well. I'm sure there are some of those present. I think the best fertilizer if we're blending up uh, organic plant matter and just pouring it on top would be to pull up some weeds for the purpose of saving money and if they're invasive weeds all the better for the environment because going out there and buying some vegetables, tubers and leaves would quickly prove expensive, although maybe you'd only need to do it once for my purposes for the cycle of growing a plant once for a few months to turn it into a plant growing series. But if the plant got big or you were growing a tree, this thing seems to be pretty fast growing, then you'd need a lot of that plant matter. So. Ideally you want to find some weeds or some kind of safe leaf you can harvest. Uh, it'd be better if you can get the root system too. I'm not sure whether you need to always sterilize it, but definitely I'd have to watch for pests and bugs. So it's day 84 and the compound leaves are yet bigger. You can see relative to my hand, um, these trios of leaflets that form a compound leaf, these pinnately compound leaves. But there's only one petiole with three uh, giant leaflets coming off of it. Um, they're pretty big and some towards the back don't look as healthy. I think some of these compound leaves grew at a time when that was before I layered on the clay loam so they're just lacking nutrition and do that curling thing on the edges. So that happened with some of my melon vines um, in 2013, 2014, the honeydew, and then later the Charangte melon vines. So for the Charangte melon vines, um, well, the vine, I just grew one. I started indoors with clamp lamps with very weak LED lights. And I remember that was the first and only series for a very long time where I went out there and hauled in 50 pounds of wild clay loam. And that grew really really quickly in the beginning the leaves were enormous so if you're interested definitely go back and check that out just for a reference point it wasn't that exciting a series afterwards because i just didn't provide it with natural light so it couldn't grow that big and eventually it just got powdery mildew all over probably just due to the indoor conditions so you can see there are still some small uh, modeled compound leaves. I think I already talked about that. So it's 
not a big deal. I could always trim off the stuff that's not aesthetic. But I think the plant is doing really, really well on its own. So I, I'll just leave it alone for quite a while and see what happens. Uh, that leaf is curled sort of backwards. So I think from this point on, if my theories are correct, we shouldn't be seeing any more of those. No new ones should be forming. So if I were to trim off everything that's curled and stunted in development or slightly mottled yellow, um, based on my theory that the plant is receiving more than enough nutrition now, proper nutrition, and the root system is a lot healthier due to adding of the clay loam, then we shouldn't see any more leaves like that. It'd be an interesting experiment. So if you're watching this and you've grown everything in potty mix, then follow my lead of the last few episodes and by all means get some real dirt and shovel it on top. Let it trickle in through successive waterings and watch your plants uh, regain health or be nursed back to health. It certainly worked for this plant, the raspberry cane, and in my adjacent pot to the right, the upper right here, my Swiss Shard growing series has gotten back on track. It was getting off to a really slow start, much like most of my plant growing series in, say, 2016, 2017, when I had sterilized uh, potting mix. I don't believe it's so much that the soil is lacking in microbes, although that is a problem, but it was more just due to potting mix being an unsuitable growing medium for uh, establishing root connections. It just doesn't make a lot of surface area contact. So you have these underdeveloped, slow growing plants that continuously wilt even in this limited a balcony sun that I receive every day. It's, a, it's not full sun, so it shouldn't be that big of a deal. It's only April 2018. So it's not that hot either, and the sun isn't as direct as it would be in, say, June or uh, the rest of summer to follow. So that's basically it, and I think, well, it seems like everything's on track to recovering right now or doing better on my balcony. I got rid of the, the scale insects for my Joshua tree, and I scooped wild dirt on top of the potting mix for that too. Which means, since I'm using potting mix for a lot of these pots, I'm still going to get a lot of uh, fungus nests. Well, maybe not a lot. I just see one here and there. If I uh, go in and out of the balcony, I might see one inside my apartment later on. But the problem is largely gone. And at some point, when I've replaced everything with wild dirt, it'll just cease. Hello and welcome back. It's day 90. This is the runaway growth story of 2018 so far, though there's not that much competition. The Swiss chard plants got off to a later start, and the pineapple crown isn't doing much. The Joshua tree, Josh, is growing faster, but very, very slow compared to all the other plants. But it's still hanging in there. So there's been just continuous leaf growth. I'm very happy. The uh, compound leaves just get bigger and bigger. They start off somewhat of a yellowish green and then they turn darker green or a beautiful emerald green that's sort of translucent if strong sunlight shines on them depending on what angle uh, you're looking at if you're on the other side of the sun. So these compound leaves are really really big. I wear medium sized gloves. My hands are quite meaty. So, um, I don't know how big these leaves are supposed to get, but it seems like they just keep growing. And this bottom one, which was once the prize, I think, in some of the earlier episodes, has a leaf tip that's touching the soil, the smoothie stuff on top, and it's sort of uh, got a burn tip or rotting leaf tip. But... I don't think any of these defects really matter in the grand scheme. Uh, here you can see some curled leaves in the back on uh, the lower reaches. All of the earlier foliage, which was probably deprived of nutrition because that was pre um, that all predates me putting on clay loam, wild dirt, in a big fat layer. And then 
there was the banana peel smoothie and there's additional fertilization later in this episode as I'll show you it's quite interesting so this primal cane that shot off has sort of altered the trajectory of the original stick it's no longer perpendicular to the soil so it's day 92 and I was thinking what else could I supplement the banana peel smoothie with well I ate six mangoes and I saved the seeds up in the freezer, which probably helped because when you freeze uh, plant or animal cells, the uh, water expands as it freezes, so that shatters the cells. Cell walls are very tough, and by freezing all this stuff, I probably helped lyse a lot of the cells to release the contents within, and that'll make it even easier to blend as well as get nutrition into the soil mass quicker. So that's six mangoes worth of seeds and peels and you can't get the peels without a little bit of the fruit flesh attached. Some pulp and of course lots of sugar, fructose and whatnot so I hope that's not too much fruit peel and it's not too sweet. Um, banana peel is probably not sweet. I've never eaten it have heard of people in starvation situations just eating the peel and I think that's fine but I don't think there's a lot of sugar content in there compared to the banana flesh itself so upon blending this sort of resembles uh, an apple being blended in terms of colorization it's not oxidizing before our very eyes like the banana peel smoothie did before which turned quickly from yellow to black or very dark brown so on 5x fast forward you could see the salsa jar in the background, the garlic chipotle salsa running away and it's pushing that big water jug from my old water distiller out of the way as well and the pepper bottle is actually retreating along with the salt shaker. I didn't notice any of this at first until I reviewed the footage and especially on fast forward it's really obvious. So the color is not changing and it's not homogenizing anymore and I turned down the volume because I don't want to subject you to any of that it was really loud so I'm pouring this banana smoothie I mean sorry the mango smoothie and it's very viscous and somewhat messy just like the banana peel smoothie was and this is not as thick because I added more water and the consistency is definitely different because it's seeds um, I think seeds have a lot of fat in them primarily that's what they have in them so there are also carbohydrates, proteins, and of course all the compounds that developing mangoes need. So the reason I chose mango seeds is because mangoes taste delicious and you have these big seeds inside that I never ever looked at until I tried growing them last year. And I might try growing them quite soon again. I have attempts underway. But that's just a lot of organic waste that's sterile. It's not going to have any bugs or parasites in it. If I were to go out into the wild and harvest and pull up some, uh, say, wild fennel or wild mustard or just pull everything up by the roots, it would bring a lot of bugs with it. And if I blended that, maybe that would chop up the bigger bugs. But I'm not sure that it would get rid of all the eggs and other potential parasites in there. And it would be a lot of trouble to sterilize all that. So I opted for the mango seeds and peels. Maybe in the future I'll just do the mango seeds. I don't think the peels add necessarily too much. And they've got a waxy coat, I suppose. So that might not be good. So it looks um, just like a yellow slime. Uh, sort of like mustard, actually, right now. And I'm going to spread it out to more uniformly, evenly cover the surface. And I suppose this also keeps out the fungus gnats, keeps them entombed in there if they're trying to emerge and prevents adult fungus gnats from going in and laying eggs. So I think that's the one of the great benefits, at least for a few days. So it's day 95. There's continued toward growth and expansion. The leaves are beautiful dark green, depending on how far away I hold the camera and the surface of this mango seed smoothie has cracked it looks more like um, like a cookie now 
sort of like a maybe not a chocolate chip cookie but it looks like some sort of cookie almost looks like peanut brittle too so that's quite fun to look at actually it's um harkens back to those days when i had sand on top to prevent fungus gnats from going in and out as well as diatomaceous earth sort of like being at the beach well this is like being at the buffet or whatever you see a giant cookie so it's um, quite the fun innovation but I don't know what it's gonna look like in a few days and I think the nutrition will take quite a while to seep down in there although I blended it up pretty well so it's day 99 and I moved it's the same apartment complex but I'm on the other side now the balcony faces east instead of west so I get morning sun on this day, I got sun from about 7.30, well, that was the earliest I checked, all the way until 11.30. And the courtyard is very quiet. It's got a lot of birds, and it's full of queen palms and banana trees. This is pretty typical landscaping of Southern California apartment complexes. And I remember I used to have um, an apartment in a place where there was a big dense courtyard where the water fountain and seagulls would come and make a lot of noise in the middle of the night so this leaf right here is fused and I don't know what happened there but some leaves eventually started some compound leaves eventually uh, emerged with five leaflets instead of three so as with the passion fruit series if you watch that series or uh, remember anything I said in there it was basically the leaf morphology changes as the plant ages and develops now that it's more mature you'll notice uh, different leaf structures and as I mentioned before I don't think there's any need to have all the leaves look exactly the same so I changed the configuration of everything it's still the same day, day 99, and I just wanted to put my tables against here, the rail, which is open and very nice because that allows sunlight to come through the bottom as well. And that's almost full sun down there too, so I could put additional pots in there. I can get a lot more plant growing series going. I can have a lot more pots. I'll probably stick with smaller, medium-sized pots. I know more of these big... Uh, 14 inch 16 inch behemoths actually there are pots out there that are way way bigger but um, by my standards those are already quite large and unwieldy not very suitable for starting new plant series so the cookie here looks quite gross it looks moldy this uh, mango seed smoothie on the bottom and perhaps that's because we had a spate of cloudy days and I watered too much uh, but I think that rod is just confined to the surface. It'll be fine because that mold and fungi isn't uh, infesting the roots. And I don't think that's the same as beneficial uh, mycorrhizal fungi, which make mushrooms. So the leaves keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, there are some that are more defective from the earlier days on top of that original floricane. And this is a giant fused leaf. Maybe it's the biggest raspberry leaf ever. I don't know. I think the pictures that I've seen online, uh, the leaves in them look pretty puny compared to what I have here. And this really reminds me of my Charente melon series in 2014 where I used a whole big pot's worth of wild dirt. And at first, um, the clay in there provided so much nutrition that the leaves were huge. So despite the cookie looking awfully moldy and kind of gross right now, I think this series is headed towards greatness. The leaves are probably going to get even bigger. So I can't wait to see what happens. Thanks for watching. Alright, it's day 102. Welcome back for another episode of Growing Fall Gold Raspberry Cuttings. I've always wondered if the local pollinators can somehow detect whether my plants are ready to flower. I have a lot of anecdotal evidence that might suggest that's the case, such as this honeybee which just materialized and decided to groom and sun here. It must have some ability to detect when things are ready to flower. 
even though insects have limited intelligence compared to say hummingbirds they can navigate really well and remember things and even remember people's faces and so on so in the past I've had other series where the hummingbirds would come by and investigate every day to see if anything had flowered because they considered my balcony part of their territory and this is probably no exception there's been a lot of torrid leaf growth these leaves uh, compound leaves with three leaflets sometimes five are huge now some of them are the size of my hand or even greater and they look really healthy so I'm really happy about that this is a bright spot in 2018 the growth story du jour of my channel and the new leaves uh, look a little bit more yellow green but they soon turn very lush uh, dark green and huge just like everything else if you look at the bottom that banana peel smoothie with a mango seed smoothie layered on top has not aged well it looks terrible it looks like a moldy mess basically very very moldy cookie instead of a fresh one right out of the oven so I'm going to water and I know that would just make more mold but basically I figured that the mold and whatever else is in there decomposing will help release all the nutrients and as I water every few days from the top those nutrients will trickle down through that layer of clay soil and into the potting mix and transfer all the nutrients down to the root system so as you can see everything's pretty lush the original cutting is underwhelming at this point it's almost irrelevant it doesn't seem like the plant has devoted any growth to that region so it's basically obsolete but it does have an offshoot coming out of the side so maybe these are just two really big offshoots um, the one that's vertical has replaced the original essentially that maybe came out of a node um, beneath there since I buried a little bit of the stick after the series started with additional dirt and decomposing materials so it's day 110 there are lots of fungus gnats lots of mold growing on top but the growth has been great and torrid you can see this offshoot is much taller and it's almost thicker well I do think it is thicker actually than the original stick comes out at slightly different of an angle maybe it is an offshoot not a primal cane and this secondary offshoot comes off of a higher node off of that stick um, the very bottom one that's not buried at least that we can see so this one isn't as impressive as the first offshoot that comes from a lower base it it's not as thick it doesn't have as much support it's sort of at an unfavorable angle that makes it a little cumbersome or soon will so the leaves just keep getting bigger and bigger like I said they're bigger than the size of my hand so everything is going swimmingly so far and I know not a lot of people have watched this series or have shown interest thus far but that may change in the future and pick up if it does then I can make more cutting series if not and I figure out that people would rather just see things grown from seeds because they want to see the initial stages starting with cotyledons or not and the first true leaves and growing from tiny little plants into behemoths then I'll do that exclusively but this is my second cutting series and it's been a real joy it's been very easy and perhaps that's why there hasn't been a lot of uh, traffic for it because uh, maybe anyone can do this so I'm watering yet again and as you can see uh, between the leaves there's a lot of mold so I assume that as long as the mold and rot isn't festering around the roots then I'm good so currently I'm of the mindset that any organic material that's too rich and too fresh down there in the soil or potty mix that's constantly rotting when wet can and will release toxic poisonous gases that will damage the roots and kill them or stun their growth and hence it's better to have mostly real dirt or soil which is essentially rock powder with maybe less than 1% natural organic material that's already heavily decomposed 
And in this case, that's not true because I have all this potting mix that was once upon a time sterilized. And then I used this for my century plant growing series. And I fertilized who knows how many times. So it should be pretty rich. But potting mix is well draining. It holds a lot of water. It doesn't really seem to hold on to nutrients that well in my opinion. It's largely indigestible stuff like uh, wood chips and bark chips, sphagnum peat moss. But um, yeah, this plant series has gone pretty well. The spines, the stems look thick and healthy. Now, the spines actually aren't a menace, but this part of this leaf that I just bent, um, one of the leaflets was hooked onto a spine. Maybe it was due to the wind. Maybe that happened when it was developing and it was really curled. But the day after I unhooked it, which is today, everything recovered. So no harm, no foul. And this is a Californian bee fly on day 114 that I saw grooming itself. I don't know why these bees, native or otherwise, like to hang out here, but perhaps it's what I said earlier, they just like to wait for something to flower, or it's a good spot, they like the scent, who knows. So it's day 121. Look how tall the offshoot has grown. It's, um, I'm not sure if the leaves have continued to get bigger, but I would say yes. I'm just looking through all the clips in this entire series. It seems like everything just continuously gets bigger, although I'm sure the pace has slowed a little bit. So this second offshoot is a little disappointing in that it's so droopy. If this were in the wild or a garden, it would just be dragging on the ground, which is terrible. But it's working on all these flower buds. So I noticed these a few days ago. There's been a lot of May gray, a lot of marine layer days where I see no sunlight in the morning, which is bad for my plants. Sun doesn't come out until the afternoon, but since I live in an east-facing apartment now, instead of a west-facing one, um, that southwest sun doesn't get here anymore. So the original cutting has an advanced spider mite infestation. It's disgusting. Spider mites are these little plant parasites that spin webs to protect themselves and they drink the contents of plant cells with their proboscis, needle-like mouth parts, just like mosquitoes. So you might think, wow, they're really small. They only drink the cytoplasm of one plant cell at a time. How bad could that be? Well, by the time you see this, it means um, there's all these tiny, maybe first and second larval instars drinking everything and those are fifth instar adults migrating. So spider mites are ancient erected plant pests. They're 1,200 species. And I just wanted to give you an angle of this very healthy and thick offshoot that has now replaced everything from the top down. Since it's getting a little bit too tall for me to get good videography from my table, on top of my table. So my first thought was to spray some 0.6% hydrogen peroxide on everything. It's very mild. It's used to disinfect human wounds. You know, it won't do anything to us. It won't do anything to plants, really. There are some people who worry about this stuff, but I've had a lot of experience spraying this stuff, and I can guarantee that it's not going to do anything. So I thought maybe that's a good, very safe and clean way to deal with these pests. And I sprayed this on and I waited, but I still noticed some spider mites walking around. So as with a mosquito larvae episode from my passion fruit days a while ago, I think it kills maybe the majority of small insects like that, but it probably won't kill everything. So that's a big problem. And then I thought, well, this stick in the middle, the original cutting is pretty much obsolete at this point, so why don't I just cut that off? It's covered in webs, it's got an advanced infestation, it's touching the much more larger and healthier looking leaves on this magnificent offshoot. So why don't I just use, uh, cut that off and then use some insecticidal soap to disinfect that even though I'm going to throw this away. 
and the vascular tissue inside looked okay even though I don't show that here but insecticidal soap is something I tried on the Joshua tree I was a little apprehensive but nothing happened to my Joshua tree and it's just one of the safer less toxic ways to deal with uh, surface pests plant parasites and once it dries out in the sun especially it won't do anything so maybe a nighttime or shade application would be far better but for demonstration purposes I'm just showing you the first application if I see a continued infestation after two or three days I'll spray again maybe even if I don't just to be safe ideally I do it in the shade and let things sit there for a few minutes but this insecticidal soap should react almost instantly and as long as you don't do it in very hot and dry conditions in full sun it'll kill everything supposedly it comes into contact with although I don't think that's 100% the case always some insects and other bugs are very very resilient so my fourth thought was to prune away low-lying barely functional compound leaves ones very close to the base of this cutting the original cutting that served no purpose really they don't get any sun because of this very large offshoot and its giant fanned out leaves and I'll treat this as well before I throw it away but the reality is most pests can't cross even a meter of concrete balcony they just stay on their plants or whatever plant material they're attached on if you knock them off or wash them off and they fall on the table they won't be able to make it back onto your plant and infest anything but spider mites have this unique ability to secrete a little bit of silk thread and they can just stand on the edges of leaves and get blown off by the wind and that could spread the infestation to everything around here in the courtyard and it could also get to my bok choy sprouts that you see on the left um, they haven't grown very much because the may gray that I talked about earlier they've been very limited by just a lot of cold and cloudy days especially the mornings so if there's no sun in the morning and 11 30 12 rolls around then there's not going to be any direct sun for the rest of the day so I don't know if this is the same bee fly the same one that came back or is it a different one in either case it seems like my plant is very popular with the bees and bee flies so there are grubs and larvae in the organic layer on top it's uh, pretty gross in fact this entire layer is gross I had known that um, this organic layer of banana peel smoothies might attract German cockroaches thankfully I don't have those but for my case it's attracted a lot of grubs and some are alive some are dead I don't know what these are Welcome back, it's day 124. I'm doing one more insecticidal soap and hydrogen peroxide wash off treatment to get rid of spider mites. In the last episode, I showcased some up close footage of adult spider mites running around spinning webs. By the time you see that, you're in big trouble. So I cut away that old floor cane that was the original cane that I planted and then I still saw spider mites hence this treatment the insecticidal soap should kill upon contact it shouldn't take more than a few seconds once they've been sprayed with it or soaked in it they'll die immediately it gets into their spiracles uh, breathing tubes and their exoskeletons well I'm assuming they operate the same way all the insects do and arachnids so now I'm doing a wash off and I'm slowing this down here just so you can see that rainbow from the mist. So it's a beautiful plant, but up close I can notice a little bit of yellow-green modeling, um, small defects in the leaves, and I think those are all caused by this infestation and other bugs. So it's day 128. You can see a little hole on the top there. Uh, this foliage normally hangs over the balcony rail. I'm quite disappointed in how such a thick offshoot that burst out of the soil at an angle couldn't maintain its structural integrity and to compensate for that it has this sort of S-shaped curve. So these are the biggest compound leaves I've ever seen. Some of the uh, compound leaflets at the end are fused together. Some aren't as in this case. So these are huge. They're beyond what I've seen and expected from internet pictures 
and this low offshoot that came off the main trunk from one of the bottom nodes is underdeveloped but this is where the plant has chosen to reproduce and fruit so this is what raspberry flowers look like in the last episode I showed you what the buds look like there are two here and these flowers don't seem to last very long and they sort of start turning brown around the edges probably within two or three days it's not very long at all I'm always disappointed when flowers don't last long but not everything can be an orchid nor does it need to it might not serve the plant's interest just to flower for weeks or months like orchids so I decided I'm going to remove all the banana and mango peel um, crust from the smoothies the two different ones that I made before the mango seed smoothie I felt was a good idea but the mango peel and whatever the fruit pulp inside sort of made it foam so right now you can see all these fungus gnat larvae squiggling away and who knows what else is in there what kind of grubs or larvae maybe it's not just one species of fungus gnat so anyway I figured it was the banana peels and the fruit pulp from the mango the mango peel that gave this a bad consistency and if I were to make a mango seed smoothly pure mango seed maybe it'll have a different consistency and rot away faster I would really like to see this decompose faster or maybe I could use less material but my tendency is always to use more so I'm going to remove all of this and see what happens you can see there's a new primal cane coming out from the soil that's been there for a few days and I've decided I'm going to remove all of the low-lying compound leaves they're not really big they don't get a lot of sun and they're just in the way when I'm doing operations like that not only that but because of the recent spider mite infestation they could harbor a lot of adult reproducing spider mites on the undersides if you just miss one spot with all that insecticidal soap then everything will come back so it looks pretty gnarly down there it's wet it's a great environment for fungus gnats I've tried to keep this series 100% organic because that's what people like they're opposed to quote chemicals unquote but hydrogen peroxide as a wash off and a minor bug killer that's probably quite ineffective that's a compound that's formed a free radical within our cells so that's natural too well technically what is natural so I'm making a mango seed only smoothie no peels so I'm gonna see what the consistency is like so far it looks sort of like a, a bad powdered milk and I'm putting in four seeds that look healthy and by healthy I mean if you've peeled and uh, examined many mango seeds before the ones that I'm putting in right now are the ones that look healthier they're white beige light in color unhealthy ones I, sh I would say are the ones that have these gray and black zones just right out of the seed coat already I think those areas have begun decomposition in that black or gray um, those bruises run more than skin deep so this smoothie is pasty white because I only use four good seeds and I'll distribute this between this pot and the Joshua tree pot the Joshua tree pot I've removed the old smoothie crusts as well so as you can see it doesn't foam and it's more full of particulates so they drain pretty easily and I imagine this will have the desired effect it won't form an impermeable crust so I didn't have enough to cover that entire layer of surface so I blended up eight other seeds that were more rotten looking meaning they had those gray and black patches or, or zones and apparently it doesn't run just skin deep because as you can see the coloration here is totally different but I figured I'm short on material and this should be okay because it's all gonna rot here anyway it only concerns the aesthetics uh, maybe the first two or three days after application so this is what it looks like after it dries out and pretty much settles very quickly you can see the uh, popped bubbles leave behind these little craters and it looks like a evenly coated layer of organic sand and some of it got on the stem that I pruned and that's pretty much it I expect for each 
successive watering, water will drain through this very, very quickly. Now going back to what I was saying earlier, I haven't used any non-organic pesticides to deal with these spider mites and I think this insecticidal soap is still lacking in performance. It's day 131 and that offshoot is the workhorse of this plant. It leans over the balcony rail and does all the photosynthesis with its huge leaves. You can see this new offshoot is starting to gain steam. It doesn't look to be covered with any spider mites or bugs yet. So that's good. We get a reboot. And I noticed an adult spider mite on this giant offshoot hanging over the balcony. So it's got a thick stem, but it still sort of lacks structural integrity. The flowers are coming along nicely on this lower, much underdeveloped offshoot. And I hope I can see some raspberries pretty soon. Uh, local bees are interested in visiting this every day. And on the big offshoot again, I was wondering if that was a, just a big aphid. Because I've seen some online that look like that. So I'm watering and um, basically there are cracks in places where this big uh, mango seed smoothly dried out and the water can go in there. It can go around the perimeter because there are cracks there as well. But it also just um, soaks through this entire layer of dried out smoothie. It doesn't take long at all. So it's basically impossible to flood the top as I've found. And it has a very small watering tray so you don't want to test its limits otherwise you see a waterfall coming out of the watering tray which is really annoying and messy to clean up. And there are definitely many bees that are interested in visiting my flowers. Flowers aren't in a great position, but they can see it just fine. And I've seen baby earwigs, pincer bugs crawling around. I don't know what that is. So it's day 134. So by day 140, you can see this offshoot and its big thick spiky stem is resting entirely on the balcony rail. Luckily, I've been able to position it so that uh, none of these really big compound leaves get jammed up and broken off, but it's still growing. So it's not my favorite kind of um, shrubby growth. I like things with structural integrity. I like things that can stand up like trees and not fall over. But as you can see, there are so many new primocanes that it's almost hard to count. Let's see, there's this big one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, um, possibly eight, maybe more on the way. It's hard to tell um, how many there are exactly because there are so many little cracks in or places where the mango seed smoothie is bumped up. Oh, I just noticed another one close to us. So yeah, that's going to result in a very crowded situation. And I'm wondering if this is bark developing on this uh, offshoot. It's been a very slow process, but it looks like bark is developing. So that's a first for me. So anyway, if these things are all going to grow in parallel, their leaves are going to bump into each other. And this first mover is really going to dominate. I bet it's going to get really thick and generate huge leaves. Hopefully everything doesn't just fall over in the most awkward positions. But if it does, if they all fall over, I imagine they'll go the same way this original giant offshoot, this workhorse did. And basically everything wants to get more sun because once it hangs over the rail, it's not limited to four hours or four and a half hours of sun a day. So you can see there are some burned edges. I don't know if that's from insecticidal soap or hydrogen peroxide. So yeah, um, these have been around for a few days, a week or two already. And this is how raspberries form. This is all new to me, so I expect to have a harvest by the time I have my next episode ready to publish. Thanks for watching. Welcome back for our 10th episode of Growing Fall Gold Raspberry Cuttings. It's day 146. I bought some Spectracide Triazocide. It has pyrethrins as a main ingredient. Those are from chrysanthemum flowers. And piperonal butoxide in the greater concentration. This is kind of white foamy 
substance that helps act as an enhancer. It doesn't do anything itself, but it helps to deliver this pyrethrin and all whatever analogs they're using into the insects and other pests, arachnids that I'm trying to get rid of. So it says, may be applied on day of harvest. Um, don't let it run off and drip. And do not apply more than 10 times per season. So do not apply within three days and etc. So you can actually burn the leaves by spraying too close and shake before using hold can 18 to 24 inches. That's way too close. This is the first time I bought this in can form and the first time I tried it at night um, it was just way too much. There was a lot of that uh, piperonal butoxide foam getting on everything. So this gets rid of a lot of things. Uh, earwigs, uh, scale insects uh, which are in my pots and most importantly spider mites. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, fungus gnats. Um, so you definitely don't want to spray this too close because the pressure inside the can, a new can, is pretty considerable and you're just going to get this white foam all over everything and that'll burn the leaves as I'll show you later on. But I had to do something. My plants are heavily infested with spider mites and fungus gnats and other things. So it's mostly the spider mites that I gotta watch out for. And the top of this can looks a little weird and I kind of expected a red straw to come out of that like with an air duster but let me just show you um, what kind of distance you should be spraying this at. So you give it a shake and let it fly and you can see when you first press the button maybe the can is like this when it's new and maybe the problem will be solved later on when the pressure is lower and some of it's used up but Look at all this uh, white milky spray on everything. So that's fairly concentrated. The reason they have other agents in there aside from the pyrethrins is they want to be able to deliver this. So not everything is water soluble. If it's semi soluble or organic solvent soluble, they got to add those things in to deliver it. So this is actually a few days after the first application. I was just giving you a demo right now. And as you can see, the new primal canes are just bursting out through this dried up mango seed smoothie. It's really amazing how many there are, but some of these new leaves are burned. It does say on the can, uh, beware of spraying this on new foliage, new growth. So we have some burns there, but also on the older foliage, these leaves are already quite old. And as you can see, the fruits are still developing. But because I've had this spider mite infestation and burned some leaves, I'm kind of worried about whether I'm going to get fully developed raspberries. Maybe the first few fruits won't go to fruition or something will go wrong. But as you can see, there are some heavily burned leaves and I had to do this because of the spider mite infestation. Uh, dating back to when I first got started with plant growing series with my sweet potato series in 2013, one of my first series, I had a really bad spider mite infestation and those just came out of the potting mix. So in the last year or so I've introduced some wild California clay soil that's sort of a reddish tint to it uh, into my pots and maybe it came from that but I'm not quite sure. I think cuttings in general tend to do this like with my um, other cutting, the California wild grapevine. So as you can see, bees are still coming and they seem to be okay as long as you don't blast that pyrethrin uh, spray in their face. You know, they'll do fine. So it's day 156 and the leaf burn is bad. I've lost many of these magnificent leaves. One of them snapped somehow. I don't know. Maybe a bird landed on it or, or something. I don't see how that could just snap like that. And many of these leaves are burned. The new ones... It's really unsightly and this is the first time I've ever seen bark form so if you're wondering what the transition from green fleshy juicy stems to woody bark like stems is like then this is basically it. Um, it's, it occurs in patches and then it slowly creeps and uh, develops and eventually the whole stem will look like that I imagine. So it's a nice new experience very interesting and there's just way too many of these new primal canes. There's severe overcrowding 
and I think the whole pot will be like this basically within a few weeks it'll just have all these parallel primal cane shooting straight up and I rue the day in which they'll get too big and start to flop in all these directions these things are thorny so they're quite unpleasant to handle and the fruits uh, they're still very greenish and they're not really developing the way I envisioned but it seems like this one that's uh, on the right upper right it's got more of these uh, berry uh, I don't know what you'd call those uh, globules or whatever so it's day 157 the next day spider mite infestation was not dealt with these look like mating fungus gnats or whatever or some other kind of bug uh, there's just vermin everywhere and you can see to the left of this screen some fungus gnats I mean uh, spider mites just kinda blowing around in the wind so this is what I think adult spider mites look like the fifth instar I believe and they're just crawling everywhere looking for new homes new sites to infest and as you can see even in a gentle breeze they have traits of spiders they let out a silken thread and carry away in the air and land on everything and destroy everything so this is the second pyrethrin spray on everything except for my bok choy plants um, everything's heavily infested with a bunch of different species of bugs and you can see the Joshua tree trunk coming nicely along there. The Joshua tree is the most resistant. Succulent uh, leaves or blades or fleshy stems will do great. But if you keep spraying anything else on leaves like these, uh, they basically burn up. So it's day 160 and I'm pruning away all the collateral damage. It's really unsightly. It's really a pity that I'm losing all of these huge magnificent compound leaves and they stop growing after a while just due to the infestation I'm sure they would have gotten bigger they're very productive obviously because of that massive surface area and them hanging over the edge of the balcony rail instead of four four and a half hours of morning sun they get perhaps six or even seven so that's added a lot of productivity if these primal canes that are coming out fall over the rail likewise they'll add a lot to this plant's production and you can see the berries are coming along nicely although I'm sort of waiting for more of these uh, round globules to come out and uh, form a berry that we recognize it doesn't really look like a berry it's day 168 and we're on the long road to recovery pruned away a lot of that collateral damage and the new shoots and their leaves are more of a yellow green but that's normal based on everything we've seen earlier on in this series and the older foliage is green it seems like there's no more sign of spider mite infestation but I won't rule out another blast with the pyrethrins to get rid of the remaining stuff um, I might even buy more heavy-duty insecticides for my Joshua tree for example because that's not something I'm gonna eat so why should I keep spraying something that's not really that potent and uh, it's still covered in bugs anyway just at least not with spider mites so fungus gnats are okay as long as they don't eat the roots of the plant you've got all that mango seed smoothie that's dried out to feed on on the underside where I imagine it's wet and covered in maggots and this offshoot has seen much better days so this is the way I want to water take out that um, showering nozzle and basically pour it on this dried out mango smoothie crust on top is very neat it seals in moisture and it has its own aesthetic look to it but you definitely don't want to use the showering cap because it, it's gonna spray and bounce off all those leaves all these primal canes and make a big mess like it always does so if you pour like this you'd be surprised at how uh, quickly the soil mass and the rhizome I presume that's in there which is probably giant by now absorbs everything so some of this water will run to the tray if it's really dry and then it gets sucked back up within a few minutes it's pretty amazing so this is a small pot and it's a fun pot to use 
but it doesn't have a lot of watering capacity so I have to be really careful not to uh, overwater because then nutrients and water will spill out of that tray and make a huge mess so these are gone some of them fell off maybe got eaten by birds I think they just fell off they look pretty gross so I waited too long and these look a lot more like real berries we should be eating so in the next episode I'll probably give you a demo of me eating them thanks for watching alright it's day 172 of this fall gold raspberry series things didn't go as I planned as always so that's why it's been a very long time since I've done an update and I've been compiling footage here and there but I haven't been really serious about gathering footage for this because everything ground to a standstill at some point and I'm back in troubleshooting mode although things went really really well in the earlier episodes so as you can see there's so many of these uh, offshoots growing out of the ground so it seemed very very promising at this point all the foliage was lush it did spray with some pyrethrins and here you can see bark developing it looks like everything's going right and you can see a little bit of leaf burn on the edges that'll happen if you spray it with anything other than rainwater, distilled water etc if you spray anything in any concentration in my experience on leaves um, that are not succulent leaves then that will happen so as you can see these are the raspberries um, some of the earlier ones fell off I believe globule by globule so I think I'm gonna harvest those and give them a taste it's kind of a pity that they're growing on a smaller offshoot because I was thinking if they grew on the larger one maybe that could get more photosynthesis energy more sugars to be sweeter and have more thorough development so this pot is not very big it's very easy to water the surface of this pot is just crusted with cracked uh, dried out mango seed and it's proven to be real real fertile but it also attracts bugs but in this case I don't think the bugs such as fungus gnat uh, larva are a big deal because they basically only eat the crust itself and probably help digest and break down through their excretions the organic matter to provide fertilization for the plant in any case it's not that big of a deal more worried about spider mites if you've been following my growing series for the last five years you'll know that I had some tangles with spider mites right from the start because their eggs or perhaps adults were already present in the potting mix and then there was a period of time uh, during which I sterilized all the potting mix and the problem went away all right I just got one berry in here these things fall apart quite easily as you can see there are these little uh, globes or globules and I just drop that one on the ground so here's another one give these a brief rinse so they fall apart quite easily that's actually not bad it's pretty mild um, maybe they would be more sweet if they had uh, those big leaves attached for longer to photosynthesize longer but for now that's it that's the entire crop the first crop and it'll probably be a few more weeks or months before we get a second crop so that was one of the few instances in which I show my face on the channel generally I'm dialed in on the subject matter to show you that instead of my face unlike many other YouTube channels so um, now I'm spraying some pyrethrin on all my plants and I hope that will at least get rid of the fungus gnats for a while and all these other bugs like spider mites which are not insects they're a primitive sort of hybrid between spiders and mites and as you can see by day 203 that obviously didn't work so people really fear chemicals and pesticides but everything is a chemical and pyrethrins uh, modern day analogs even are very very weak so they come from chrysanthemum flowers naturally and they do kill insects and other bugs on contact although spider mites aren't even bugs um, but I'm a hundred percent sure that it was spider mites that did this 
So there are no other exogenous reasons. And here I'm just using my trusty uh, leverage durable shears, uh, pruning shears. Well, actually, they're not designed for pruning, but that's what I use them for to cut all of these dead stalks away. So I don't know what's going to happen going forward. My instinct, my gut says that if I water this and wait a few weeks, everything's going to come back. So that's what I'm going to do. But in the meantime, all of this uh, thorny dead foliage and stalks is really, really an eyesore for the neighbors and for myself. So I don't want to look at this. It serves no purpose. It's covered in spider mite webs and spider webs as well. So I'm just going to get rid of all of that. And I'm going to cut this big stalk that's hanging over the balcony. It's a real pity because it was very beautiful in its prime. If you just look back to even the previous episode or a few episodes before that, it was quite the sight to behold and it had really, really big leaves and it's developed sort of a bark, although I don't know how much of that is just due to the entire thing browning due to dying off. So it's very thick and hard to cut through. I'm going to have to cut it into smaller pieces to fit into a garbage bag and I'll dispose of everything. So I don't have much going on my balcony right now and as I said I'm just going to water this and see if it makes a comeback. I'm pretty confident that it will and I'm sure that there's perhaps a giant rhizome underneath although how big is that I don't know. Um, if it were really really big I imagine it would have pushed all the uh, potting mix and other organic matter that comprises this soil upwards. So it's day 207 with the sun shining on this mango crust and no foliage to shade anything. It just sort of looks like a barren, dried up a landscape after a fire or uh, something that's been clear cut. And as you can see, the pyrethrin spray devastated this population of spider mites. But the damage had already been done and I'm sure many, many others survived and reproduced very quickly. And you can see all of these uh, very disgusting spider mite corpses, as well as some entangled in webs, perhaps by their own making in the water tray or by spiders. So on day 228, we got some beautiful regrowth. It was very refreshing to see this. And everything looks fine, except, um, well, I guess there are not really any exceptions. There's a main stem. There are these beautiful uh, new spines, thorns developing. And I expect this to go very well. But as I alluded to in the beginning of the video, uh, it was not meant to be. So on day 291, the Santa Ana winds were added again. I'm only including footage of this at nighttime because it shows the development of the plant at that point. So it's more developed for sure, but it's quite stunted in its comeback. So it never quite got to the explosive growth that I had seen before. So on day 327, I decided I was going to try imidacloprid for the first time. It's a common insecticide. People sometimes sprinkle granules of this stuff into their indoor plants and get it in there or on there at least. And that should supposedly um, kill off all the fungus gnat larvae. So this one is sort of a white a gooey gel but it dissolves very easily and this product is not cheap. I think typically you can expect to spend maybe 15 to 20 dollars on a bottle this size. So hopefully uh, this from Bayer Advanced or Bio Advanced or whatever they're calling it is totally worth it and I won't be using that much because just by following the instructions you add about yay much and dissolve it in a certain amount of water. I didn't want to just add it to my plastic light green showering pail because I don't want to um, have that contaminated in cases where I don't intend to use it. I like to keep that completely clean with just the distilled water that goes in there. I don't like to put fertilizers in that showering can. I just want it to have straight up water. So 
doing a little bit of mixing around and then I'll do a wipe and clean everything up but that seems like a good amount of tap water to dissolve everything in I'm not going to splurge every single time and use distilled water if I don't have to so I'll shake this up and distribute it among my plants and hopefully by pouring a fraction of this into that little pot with my raspberry cutting it'll stop all the spider mites because it provides systemic resistance it gets absorbed by the plant and according to the label it can take even up to weeks for the entire plant to acquire systemic resistance and then anything that tries to drink the fluids from the cells or the stems will get poisoned I'll be publishing an episode that's a standalone video detailing the results of applying imidacloprid this way to all of my pots. So I look forward to a great 2019. I may continue this series, but not for very long, I think. At some point when it recovers, I'll just dig up the rhizome to show you what's going on down there. This is the finale episode of Growing Fall Gold Raspberry from Cuttings. It's day 343. We had some growth late last year in 2018 after I had lost all of my foliage um, late summer I believe due to a horrid spider mite infestation. I bombed everything on my balcony with pyrethrin spray and that seemed to get rid of almost 100% of the spider mites although I did see some here and there uh, later on. So you never get 100% of them. I think they do have eggs in the soil and they can come from the landscaping in the local community. So now once again we're losing all of our leaves it seems and I'm not sure whether this is due to a renewed parasitic infection by spider mites or something else or is it just due to how uh, raspberry canes lose all their foliage naturally during the overwintering process. So I think it might be the latter, although I'm not 100% sure. It doesn't make sense as to why this plant would devote all of this energy to create new foliage at the end of the year, only to lose it immediately after. We've had a very, very cold winter in 2019 in San Diego County. And as you can see, I'm doing a saturation watering with my showering can. It's dripping into the watering tray. So based on my experience, it seems like this pot of raspberry canes can't get enough water um, well it can't be overwatered, I should say so by day 384 everything withered away so I do believe it's overwintering there's a lot of moss on here um, the growing mixture in here is not ideal I did try to put on some California hill dirt and put on some mango seed that was blended for fertilization Later on, I do believe that the blended mango seed provided for a lot of nutrition in the case of my Joshua tree and even this plant. But uh, the soil mixture definitely isn't ideal. If you go any deeper than the top, maybe a centimeter or so, it's just all potting mix. And potting mix is not great for all plants. Some plants can thrive in it, but I'm not convinced that this one has... Um, an extensive root ball. It doesn't seem like it's ever done really that well past uh, the phase of last summer. So I'm hoping I can get this to renew its growth at some point, maybe during the spring. And I've already completed the entire life cycle for this, at least from the perspective of buying a store-bought cutting. I haven't grown it from seed, but I did get some fruits a very tiny amount of fruits before spider mites took everything last uh, summer. So it's day 416. Um, you know, when is this thing going to resurrect? I don't know. It seems like nothing's going on. I believe at the time of the filming of this, it was already past mid-March. So it's uh, it's been a cold winter, but at the same time I can see some green buds. They're not shoots yet. So I think this will come back to life and it doesn't seem like the watering does that much either way. Maybe I've been watering too much over the winter time. So um, yeah, I was thinking at some point I'm going to end this series because 
it's just been too long and there hasn't been that much interest in this I've gone through the whole life cycle so on day 430 I got a visit from a pair of morning doves they like to hang out on my balcony sometimes so this was just a nice shot that shows the courtyard in full sun in the late afternoon and on day 434 I finally got a watering tray for most of my pots so in the past I tended to make a big mess on this wooden table as you can see most of the finish has washed away from rain and repeated wiping and just beating from the elements so as you can see the plant is coming back it does have foliage growth but it's coming back really really slowly and you know at one point I considered the soil in this pot to be very rich but perhaps that's not the case anymore maybe it really is just the cold weather but um, you know I, I think there's something off and eventually we'll see what's going on underground at the end of this episode so I'm curious to see whether there was an actual rhizome as is described in the literature or are they just um, you know is the entire root system just underdeveloped so it's day 453 it's late April 2019 and the foliage is starting to get bigger um, it looks healthy enough and I'm just going to get rid of all these little um, dead twigs and spines that are attached so um, it's said that for raspberry canes um, the old growth is actually its own worst enemy it can provide too much shade and block new growth and foster the growth of mold and whatever but y as you can see the soil ball has been wet all the time so it's sort of moldy anyway so it's day 477 decided I'm going to do an imidacloprid treatment some of those leaves look a little yellowish so I haven't used uh, miracle Grow or anything like that for a really long time and I've watered it enough into the watering tray I've done saturation watering so that if there was too much chemical fertilizer in the past it's all been washed down into that tray it's not going to reabsorb back into the potting mix so on day 487 it's the final day of this series I decided to elucidate the root and rhizome structure underground so to speak and I knew this would be a big mess so I got a fresh new garbage bag so at first glance it appears there's not that much in the way of a complete root ball that fills up this entire soil mass just like I suspected it's not very robust uh, the rate of growth is not very quick so the potting mix has turned into sort of a it's not a black mush you know it, it seems like it's really rich but at the same time it's not performing for this plant so it seems like the root ball is somewhat incomplete I'm not expecting to find a rhizome in there it just seems like the roots did as well as they could inside of a small pot like this with uh, a less than ideal growth medium so um, yeah I don't think potting mix will last a well past the first use and it seems like for a lot of my recent projects maybe in 2017 2018 maybe even going back earlier you know 2016 um, oftentimes I would bake in the oven or steam my potting mix and then reuse it for subsequent projects thinking that since not not much had grown in it that it wasn't really depleted plus I did all that fertilization so it should all be very rich but it doesn't seem like potting mix uh, performs well past the first use so it's sort of like a disposable product it's not intended to last for more than the first um, you know six or nine months that most people will buy from the store and grow things within and then after that it just sort of becomes uh, a toxic sludge that doesn't really do much for your plants so in the future I won't be really going with that anymore um, I think I'm just going to go with what seems to be working a lot better these days which is a 50-50 mixture or some other kind of similar composition of sand and uh, clay soil that I've just been digging out from the hills outside so as you can see the original base of the cutting the original stick is right there and it seems like 
I just had all these little um, independent offshoots just growing in parallel to that stick. So it's not quite what I expected. I expected um, somewhat of a rhizome. You know, I didn't get any, it seems. I'll have to do some more exploration to rip this whole thing apart. But it just seems like um, a bunch of immature plants, uh, cuttings, that are sort of loosely fused together in a root ball. So it seems like some of these are functioning independently and generating little tiny plants. In any case, it just seems like the whole thing is a congested mess in a very small pot. And because it's a very small pot horizontally and vertically, it just didn't have that much room to expand. So it's interesting to see all these little stems um, come, growing out and taking a pretty big radius in the center of the pot. But ultimately, it wasn't really effective, you know, as a strategy for this plant colony. Um, the first year, 2018, we had some really great growth. But after that, you know, after getting berries, um, yeah, that's basically it. And this plant's uh, history kind of coincides with, you know, uh, midway through, I moved to this new apartment unit. And things really seemed promising in the first few months, but now it's just like, you know, this series is kind of long in the tooth. Um, it's not that popular. I don't think people want to see me grow things from cuttings necessarily. And they like fruit trees, but maybe I'm feeling if this was grown from seed it would have been a lot more popular that's what people want to see so that's what i'm going to provide more of in the future and you know different species have different uh, popularity levels so not everyone wants to see um, me grow berries perhaps or maybe this isn't the right kind of berry um, personally i like blackberries a little bit more so you know if i had the choice i would have bought something like that but uh you know, I thought this would be an interesting project, and it has been. It's been uh, sort of high maintenance due to the spider mite infestations. But, um, you know, I still had my fun, and it seems like this is just a garbled mess of tiny roots. So that's all it is. Um, maybe the soil mass is just not big enough to get a large tap root of any kind. Maybe this is just how cuttings perform. But um, by growing from cuttings, you do get something that's a clone and will produce a, the exact same consistency of fruit as its uh, parent shrub. So that's basically it. Um, thanks for watching my Growing Fall Gold Raspberry from Cutting series. My Joshua Tree seedling is growing faster than ever in its fourth year. My mango growing is finally working in the tube series. And I will be restarting some projects that I've failed at in the past. 